Hello, everyone. Welcome to Arash's World. Today, we have a special guest and a fun podcast. Not that the other ones are fun, but this one is specifically geared towards fun. Uh, welcome to Arash's World, Dr. Mike Rucker. Thank you so much for having me. Great. So what I'd like to do, and I'm very interested in, in your case, too, is uh, my uh, my guests to introduce themselves briefly in any way they see fit. So how would you briefly describe yourself? Yeah, so by academic uh, background, I'm an organizational psychologist. Uh, I've evolved into a behavioral scientist, really looking at uh, the things that move folks into productive and healthy behaviors. I am now an author. Uh, I have a best-selling book called The Fun Habit that came out in January, where I have really looked at the construct of fun. Um, you know, in psychology, we call it hedonic tone, but how enjoying ourselves and finding fun in the things we do can lead to betterment and then juxtaposed to this sort of Western ideal of chasing happiness and how problematic that has become. Yeah, we, we can talk about your book in a moment, but I, I noted also that on your website, I believe that a uh, future astronaut is on your list of things to do. Um, is that, are there any plans specifically towards that? Yeah, so I put my down payment on, uh, uh, you know, the Virgin Galactica. And oh, yeah. then ultimately, Richard, you know, uh, changed the game a little bit. I think it's a little bit more expensive than he had hoped because initially the down payment was in the thousands. And now he wants a, a $10,000 commitment because I think, you know, it's a six figure sum right now. They're not commoditized in it the same way that they thought. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to do that uh, before I die. In That's the so book, cool. I talk about, you know, the astronauts. Um, you know, this idea of earth gazing. And I just, I want access to that. I want to, I want to actualize in physical terms how insignificant we really are. I think so many of us, right, build our worlds around ourselves, right? And we're, you know, I mean, we're all important, but to some degree, we're small parts of something bigger. And the ability to see earth from outer space would just cement what I, you know that my sort of personal growth and my idea of transcendence so yes it's definitely going to be something i do before i pass away and that, that's a wonderful goal and ironically going out of space brings us more down to earth <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> right speaking. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> cool and you're God, as it were. Exactly. Your book is The Fun Habit, How the Pursuit of Joy and Wonder Can Change Your Life. Um, now, fun is really important, but and happiness is as well. But it seems quite elusive. And I think like fun should be pretty easy to access. So wh what is the issue here? What is the problem? So there's a ton of different headwinds, right? I, and different headwinds are going to affect different people. But I think primarily... There's a few things, right? So especially people in middle age, we're in an era called the sandwich generation where we're having kids later than we ever have. Thank you, science. And we have parents that are aging older than we ever have. Thanks again, science. And I'm looking forward to, you know, rightful old age. But that means that uh, because of this kind of shift, right, a lot of folks have domestic duties that they've never had before. Then, you know, even for the younger generation, this idea of moving from knowledge or, or heuristic work, um, or excuse me, moving from algorithmic work, where we used to know what was needed for us to kind of fulfill our work day to heuristic knowledge work, where the goalpost is always kind of moving. It means our to-do lists never really end, right? We don't know when the week ends. And that's fueled even further by the fact that technology has been built to, you um, keep us in the office as long as we want to be. And so things like Gmail and Slack have been built with the same behavioral science tools that keep us addicted to Facebook and Twitter, right? We get an email and especially if we like what we do for a living, we're like, oh, you know, that kind of cognitive um, dissonance of not knowing, you know, what's in that email. If we don't open it, it can be really uncomfortable. So what happens is we never essentially shut down our brain we're working all of the time and it's clear that there does need to be a break from work to leisure and the fact that we're not doing that has become quite problematic to the point that you're seeing record levels of burnout especially in the west that you that you've never seen before and for some reason we're one of the last in line to actualize this right the eu is, is and and oceana for that matter 
they're really becoming attuned to this. They're playing with a four day work week in earnest and seeing that it reduces absenteeism, has very little impact on productivity by time and actually has an increase with regards to output when you look at you know units of time versus you know productivity in, in, in various measures. And it certainly has huge impacts for morale. Then you're seeing other sort of like lower level interventions. I think France is leading the way in this where companies that are even working, you know, five days a week are still insisting that email servers get shut down at the end of day Friday to preserve yeah. people's weekends. For whatever reason, the social norm here in the U.S. is quite the opposite. We protect work instead of ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and so there's that headwind. Um, and then there's just the fact that we are so burnt out as a society. A lot of us don't have the energy to do anything but what science calls passive leisure to sort of displace that discomfort. And so we trick ourselves into thinking it's fun, but it's not true pro-social behavior or things meant for a betterment where we feel good about how we spent the time. You know, it's things like mindless social, social media use or, you know, again, I don't villainize watching shows if you're doing it with friends or it's something that you know, I ask you, you know, three weeks from now, what were you watching? And you tell me in rich detail, because it really was fun for you to watch it. I'm talking about people that are so exhausted, they plop down on the couch and, you know, mindlessly watch shows to just essentially get them out of their heads so that, you know, and so that's where we're at now, um, especially again, here in North America, with regards to just really not enjoying ourselves and now seeing, you know, the dire consequences of that. Yeah, there, there are quite a few things that I want to jump upon because there's like so so many ideas they're expressing here. The, the sure. work life balance, I think, uh, that is that is hugely important to to. And I don't even think you can call right. it a balance anymore. Like that yeah. sort of worked before, yeah. you yeah. know, this technology kept us all on, but now it really is a blend, right? Yeah. Like, and so um, we can get into it, but the the culprit is the fact that we don't have transition rituals. You know, it before when there weren't phones. When you yeah. pulled into your driveway, you, you knew the workday was done and most people would take a deep breath and then they would get ready for domestic duties and enjoying the time they had outside of work. Now, so many people are still on a work call as they walk into their house, right? Yeah. And so that, you know, for folks with kids, that models the behavior like, hey, you guys aren't really important and go ahead, get on your screens, you know, to, to do whatever you want. And then they wonder why there aren't these, you know, intimate relationships within you know, the family unit. And so there are all sorts of, uh, of different things at play, but, um, you know, again. There seems to be no pause button. And as you're saying with technology, where like they can access it at any point and, and there's the curiosity of like, I want to see what they're saying, even though I know it's not good for me, or it's like getting me more involved with the, with the work routine. Then I think one thing that, that they have shown and the, this science, again, if we go by science, the four-day work week has had either the same amount of productivity or slightly higher according to right. the research they've done. So I don't understand why we're sticking to the extra day that doesn't bring us any benefits whatsoever in terms of productivity, but would bring immense benefits in terms of, of happiness and, and, and job satisfaction. Yeah, so there's, unfortunately, when you've habituated behavior and especially it's so ingrained to the social norm, it really does take huge momentum to be able to make those changes, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things I talk about in the book that I thought was a pretty interesting intervention, but obviously fell flat because if it's not adopted, if it's not comfortable enough that, um, or there isn't so much pain that a radical change can be undertaken, then it just doesn't take root, right? So um, this example that I'm bringing forth was from Ariana Huffington, who was talking a lot about burnout before the pandemic, right? Kind of leading the cause. And she had this amazing app that it, if you were on PTO, it responded to any incoming email, essentially informing that person, this person is enjoying their vacation. And so don't bother them. They're not going to read this email. So it's going to be deleted. But if it's important enough, then please do resend the email when they're back in the office at such and such date. I don't oh think God. that's yeah. that aggressive, right? I mean, it's yeah. essentially, um, you know, just saying like we're creating the psychological safe space because leisure is important. And if yours is important, they'll get back, you know, then, then, then follow through yeah. instead of like this avalanche of email that essentially undoes any of the benefit, benefit right, of, of taking a vacation. 
And so she's a powerful force and ultimately no one used this app and now it's not even available anymore. And so here's a pretty low level micro example of something that could be hugely beneficial. That's not even that disruptive that because of such entrenched social norms never got picked up. So if something like that can't be adopted, I mean, we're a long ways off, you know, from giving everyone Fridays off. Unless we get forced though. I mean, the pandemic showed us and it like increased the technology and working from home. This was like a, a taboo thing before and now it's perfectly normal. So it seems like we need like people to push forward because it's the status quo is, is pretty firm and we just need to break those. Those are habits too, you know, and talking about like, work habit versus fun habit. And we want to kind of change the gear and go in that direction as well, right? So of, of, of pushing it on and saying, look, this is for the benefit of everyone. Working from home is actually a good thing and the pandemic forced us, but now we're seeing those, those benefits. Why not expand that in, in different areas as well? Yeah, and I think you are seeing folks try to figure out, you know, this quote unquote hybrid environment that meets mm -hmm. people in the middle. My wife works for a billion dollar company and they are now doing half day Fridays, you know, with the expectation mm -hmm. that you make it up Monday through Thursday, but that's a very welcome to change. So I think progressive companies are figuring that out. It's an interesting time, right? With the advent of AI, like I think folks are afraid of losing their jobs. And when we're in this fight or flight mode, we tend to want to work more because we want to get ourselves out of discomfort. So that's another headwind that's affecting some folks. Um, but like, ultimately you're right. I mean, you know, study after study does show that folks that are invigorated through taking some time off the, the table for themselves show up to work as more productive, but not only that, right. Not only with more vigor and vitality to be more productive, they're also the ones that seek out harder challenges. So they tend to be the most invigorated because when we're in this constant state of distress, then we tend to use more algorithmic thinking. You know, in science, we call these heuristics because we are kind of scared, right? We're like, we just need to get from point A to point B because we're more worried about survival. When we're able to relax, you know, because we are enjoying ourselves and the world seems fun and a safe place, then we're able to think, you know, in a more horizontal fashion because we don't feel like our job's at risk, right? Or that we have to get it right. And so there are clear benefits, especially for uh, folks, you know, in creative fields to create the space for them to enjoy themselves, you know, outside of their vocation. But for whatever reason, especially here in the U.S., it's just such a hard sell, you know? Yeah. And I, I think part of it is because of this work ethic that is ingrained within us, like psychologically, we just like, if you're not working, you're not productive. You basically don't have much value to society or even personal value. And this is something that resonates with, again, Protestant work ethic that, uh, you know, the U.S. is, is founded upon. And, well, and meritocracy, that... right? We're taught that mm -hmm. if we work hard, you know, yeah. if we work more than the next person, then we'll get that carrot at the next level. And, and... idleness is seen as a sin, you know, because you are wasting time. And therefore, uh, anything that is basically fun and brings us joy could be labeled as, as idle. And so I think that is the fear of like and unholy, oh, right? And that context. unholy, exactly. And <laughs> and the fact that we're actually God is always watching us more with the Protestant as opposed to Catholic belief that we have to be always on the run. And I think that is so like deeply enmeshed with with who we identify ourselves as in, in North America that uh, um, we feel guilty when we're not working, and that is causing that that kind of reaction too that we have. Yeah. And on the other side, um, some people, because hedonism has been so villainized, they conflate the construct of just enjoying themselves sometimes as thinking that all of a sudden they're going to fall victim to this, you know, life of whimsy or, you know, go to yeah. Burning Man for the rest of their lives and forget work, which is runs contrary to what we know from the science. So there's a principle that I uh, fell on to when I was you know, doing all the research for the book that just really illuminated um, why this stuff is so important. It's called the hedonic flexibility principle. Mm -hmm. And we know that folks that aren't enjoying themselves some of the time are so depleted that it essentially becomes a downward spiral. But those that are really deliberate about creating these transitions that we already talked about and scheduling fun 
and prioritizing pro-social behavior. So you're not just ruled by dopamine, but also getting, you know, some of squirts of the other neurochemicals, you know, most importantly, oxytocin and feeling connected and having empathy. So you're not so self-centered. Those are the people that not only are having fun, but are doing, you know, um, harder stuff, cooler stuff with more creativity and curiosity. And so it's just really unfortunate that we've been led astray to the point that um, we're burning ourselves out, not having fun, and ironically, being our least productive selves, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And when, when we look at education, too, and that's something that I'm, that's my profession as well. So, and I found like education was generally not much fun. And it seems like fun is like, that's anti-academic, basically, or seen as that. And and then we we do have like uh, philosophers who play around with with that like we have French philosopher like Jack Derrida was like like bringing in to play into it and that kind of fun mold and I'm thinking like, that's actually one of the main reasons I became an instructor was because um, I said this could be done in a in a more fun way and so if we can instill that from the beginning also in terms of the education system and say it's okay to have fun is actually good because then that leads to motivation. But education has mostly been about just knowledge. But now we have yeah. AI that can provide the knowledge. So then we don't need the educators anymore if that's really the aim of education. Well, I think we still need pro-social behavior for things to you know, remain interesting. But along the lines of education, uh, work that I really like comes from Caitlin Woolley and Dr. Fishbach. And they've looked at how when educators do use tools to make things more engaging mm -hmm. the kids show more resilience more interest in the material mm -hmm. they tend to encode the information more so recall is better um, they definitely feel you know more attachment to the teacher so you know there's less sick days because they're not you know I'm, I'm sure you can make presumptions but i would assume because they want to go to school right mm -hmm. and so these tools are important but we've done everything through this lens of martyrdom Right. And sort of, you know, task based yeah, linear, yes. you know, OK, you score high on this test and you'll get to the next level that we haven't looked at ways that can be potentially more expansive. And, yes. you know, not to s circle back on, you know, some more of the macro data, but as you kind of alluded, we're seeing, you know, if you look at measures of, you know, general productivity like GDP and whatnot, those are actually, you know, being reduced when you look at total work hours, right? I mean, they're slightly going up, but that's because the population as a whole is going up. When you normalize it for population growth, we keep producing less and less, even though we're, you know, working more and more and more. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, it kind of starts with the school, right? Like if we could somehow still find the right key performance indicators so that, you know, we're keeping people accountable, but then also making it less, you know, about meritocracy and more about, you know, general growth and supporting each other, then we're starting sort of at the beginning, right, rather than having to fix it from the top down. So I do think these things become extremely important as we're trying to, you know, grow the amount of opportunity that's available for everyone. And what I see, I, I think happiness is, is is elusive. It's it's hard to get to. It's more complicated. It depends again on the person and so on. But I think fun well, is. I think dependent I on think... the certainly on the frame we have. When right. you look at collectivist right. societies, when folks truly share happiness amongst groups, mm -hmm. then you know, the things that we're talking about become less problematic because it's the rising tide analogy, right? Mm -hmm. But here in the West, we're it's so much a product of self self worth, right? You know, we're very much living in an individualistic society that everything that makes us feel good is really an a, essentially a a mirror image of how we feel society looks at us, right? And so once it's externally motivated by that, once it's outcome driven, then you see, you know, uh, interesting and generally negative consequences come from that, and so the people that get it right are ones that are able to exist in both paradigms. So yeah, I want to do a good job and I'm going to, you know, do the best I can. And generally they will, that will still bear fruit because they're you productive and they figured out a way to exist in that paradigm without being so fixated on if anything bad happens, that's going to 
you know, negatively impact my self-worth and kind of bring me down. Does that make that's sense? It. I got kind of existential there, but yeah, uh, no, no, perfectly. And so, I, but it's it's more complicated in in the in that sense. And yes, collectivist societies uh, they have a different concept and conception of it. But it also comes down to when when I was in Mexico, I saw poor people who were farmers, and they had so much more fun and happiness, and they're much more generous as opposed to those who are uh, upper middle class and higher. So, so there, there's that, that element of like money that we think makes us happy. And that's not really part of the equation necessarily. But my point is also for fun. I mean, you can make anything fun. You don't like even like, let's say, washing the dishes or chores that we have. We can uh, change our perception of it and make it as, as something that, that's fun for us, that we enjoy. Fun is something that's accessible to us anytime, anywhere, at any moment. Like this right moment, I'm having fun. And I can increase that by having more podcasts and talking longer to you because that, that's enjoyable. So it's it's not that hard. It's just like, I think it's really a shift of like, don't do things that the way that feels forced and just kind of relax and go with the flow and enjoy those moments that you get. Get your work done, but at the same time, don't see it as a chore or like, you know, drudge and so on, but just like find a different approach to it. So I find that easier. So what would be the fun habit? How can we have more a habit that is geared towards that, that element of, of fun? Yeah. Again, it's really about that radical reframe, right? If you find yourself <laughs> stuck, exactly. yeah. unpacking which one of those headwinds that we've kind of discussed over the last half hour are affecting you for a lot yeah. of folks, you know, especially between the ages of 30 and 50, it's going to be that weird sort of inherent sense of guilt that doesn't make much sense, but is a pretty entrenched social norm yeah. that you need to unpack. So, you know, if you're enjoying yourself and, you know, for whatever reason, you're feeling uncomfortable in that moment. like We call it so, guilty pleasures, right? Right. Nice thing, yeah. Go for those guilty pleasures because yeah, they're, they're which is wild, fun. right? Even just yeah. that frame, like, you know, all, you know, semantics and words uh -huh. do carry powerful meaning Absolutely. and so sit with it and wonder why, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing that the science indicates that you're actually going to be more productive if you're, you know, enjoying yourself and you're actually, you know, creating a space for leisure when it becomes uncomfortable and you kind of wish that you, you know, your hands reaching for your phone because, you know, you know, you can't be in a space where your mind sort of winds down, you know, your amygdala gets out of that fight or flight, um, where your brain is actually slowing down, the car is not redlining as a, as a metaphor, mm -hmm. ask yourself why, and that can often be the first step, right? Because it does take, you know, you brought it up a couple of times, the reason the book is called The Fun Habit is you do need to rehabitualize that behavior. And so we had this sort of awakening in the 90s, right, where so many, you know, entrepreneurs and digital nomads were wearing sleep deprivation as a badge of honor, right? Because it's kind of what we yeah. did. And we're being busy. We were, when you say you're busy, I have no time. That's seen as a badge of honor because, look, I'm important because uh, and whereas like if, if you have a lot of free time, you're seen as lazy and like, you know, not working enough or slacking, basically. That's right. Yeah, yeah I think they, you know. That's literally what we called them in the 90s, right? Slackers. There was a yeah. movie about it, right? Yeah, yeah. And like, far be it if you have this A type slant that, you know, to fall victim to that. But again, the irony is that you aren't being the best version of yourself. You know, that when you look time and time again, there there's something called survivorship bias, right? So there are these like humongous outliers, like, you know, the one in a billion people like Elon that have you know, a uh, biological predisposition, he's already admitted on SNL that he has, you know, a cognitive deficit that allows him to not operate as, you know, a normal person, right? You know, there's certain um, drawbacks to having something like Asperger's, but there's also superpowers where, you know, you, you don't necessarily, you don't fall victim to the deluge of information that so many of us are, right? And so for a majority of people, we need that sleep, right? The same goes with leisure. We've seen it time and time again that if folks aren't creating this space where they're not chewing on a big, you know, either personal domestic problem or professional problem, where they can kind of clear the lens, enjoy themselves, let their biological systems sort of, you know, take a, a breath, um, and then also set up 
you know, the uh, runway for good sleep. Because when we're working up until we go to sleep, you know, study after study shows that we're not getting deep sleep, right? Because we're <laughs> potentially bringing those work problems into our sleep. If we're not enjoying ourselves, we're just not acting as the best version of ourselves. So again, going back to how, you know, uh, sleep hygiene really needed to be brought forth and thought of in radical ways over the last couple of decades. And now I think we're there. You know, no one would ever say, hey, you know, just cut out sleep and you'll be yeah. successful. Yeah. Yeah. We're now seeing the same, uh, you know, with leisure. And there were people really making head roads. Again, Ariana Huffington being one, um, you know, 37 Signals is another amazing example of a company, you know, that had clear guardrails and were showing, you know, the benefit of being able to keep a very lean team by making sure that they time blocked their work and gave folks you know, life outside of work. And then I, it hasn't been well studied, but I, I think you could say that the great resignation, you know, a lot of the roots of that movement were because people realized that they were giving too much away, you know, essentially lining the pockets of, you know, the higher echelon and they weren't enjoying themselves and they wanted to, right. Or if they were going to give it all away, certainly wanted to be in a fun environment or for a cause that they cared about, not just, you know, making another, you know, VC uh, really rich. Right. And so um, I think we're getting close. We were getting close before the pandemic, the pandemic put us all into fight or flight, right. Rightfully, because it was a crisis, yeah. but now there's a silver lining there where I think a lot of people realized, okay, now that I'm putting back together the rhythms, you know, and, and um, habits of my life, I want to do it in a way that is uh, you know, more holistically productive to my general well-being. And yeah, so, and go ahead. We don't want to be driven, though. I think that's the thing. And I see, like, with self-development, people are really obsessed with it to, to a degree that becomes harmful. So just to give an example, I, I know people who say they meditate for four days a week, and they say, I want to make it five days. And I think, well, if, if you're okay with your four days, why does it have to be five? And I don't enjoy it. I'd rather enjoy taking a walk and being mindful of my surrounding, which is more pleasurable and more enjoyable. So I do that. And the, the, the effects and benefits are actually much higher than forcing myself to sit down and listen to my breath or, and so on. So I think it's kind of relaxing a bit more instead of like constantly like compulsively trying to do everything, right? And so that's, that's hard to do. I, I took uh, the, the class that Laurie Santos has on the science of well-being on unhappiness. That's a great class. And what yeah. the, it's a great class. There's a lot of useful information. But then again, I think like, well, she doesn't seem that happy herself. So it's this is what science says. What can we like incorporate? And she's come that? out and said it. Said and she much. has in her class. She yeah. has right. So I'm wondering, well, is it is it really working? Are we maybe should we change, as you say, our, our mind frame, our the mindset that we have about that, or should we approach it in it from a different angle? And for me, well, I, I think, think what's interesting is folks like myself and Laura that talk yeah. about this we elevate ourselves to the point where she was doing so much work around this because the class got uh -huh. so popular, right? Second yeah, most did. popular. They, they had a teen class. version as well, which was just kind of interesting. Though, how, yeah. And, you know. um, and then I think she was productizing it, but the research that she brings forth there, Cassie Holmes from UCLA is one of the researchers here. And then a lot of work through uh, U of Penn, on time affluence is hard to deny though. And so the folks that do value time over money and so have these, you know, clear bumper rails uh, of making sure that they, you know, preserve space for themselves are clearly happier, at least as a statistical average. Right. And so I don't think you can skirt that fact, you know, mm -hmm. Laura's an N of one where she didn't eat her own dog food and I'm throwing a big rock at a glass house. Cause right now promoting the book, I'm grinding <laughs> it out. Right. And I'm probably yeah. definitely could right. be having more fun. Um, but again, you look at the research and the folks that one, aren't that outcome focused and two do value time over money, realize that that's a true finite resource and money. If you really want it, you know, you can generally get more of it. Any of us could probably pick up an Uber job if we really wanted, you know, needed money. And again, oftentimes, you know, in, in this point of the interview, I'll, I'll put the asterisks in. Some of this comes from a place of privilege. If you're at the bottom of Maslow's triangle and you're either, you know, you're in significant pain because of a chronic illness or you can't feed your family, like, yeah, you know, 
go listen to another podcast because you know having fun is definitely a, a, comes from a place of privilege it means you know you're kind of looking for the higher needs in life right but, but if you are in a place where you're not feeling fulfilled but all of your psychological safety needs are being met then i do think you know a radical course corrective of figuring out how can i live this meaningful life but also enjoy it too becomes an important conversation so in time, we say time is money, but I would say time is a precious commodity. And then how do we spend it like money? And where do we spend it? And but what time parts isn't of money. I, I don't like that. I'm not, I don't like that. Exactly. traded for money. You know? But it's valuable. But, it's valuable, right. but it's not money. Right. But that right. is something we're, 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 again, driven by this idea, uh, conscious subconsciously as well. It's like, okay, I just wasted money doing this that i enjoy it could have worked and so we, we need to get uh, reframe that or change that or change our attitude towards it but one thing from the course that i like uh Laura's course was um when you spend money going back to that and when you spend money on others it gives you more pleasure than when you spend it on yourself which seems counterintuitive but at the same time it makes perfect sense yeah no i think that's Interesting. So she's uh, citing work from Dr. Dunn out of Canada. And um, you need to be careful about making big inferences from a pretty small sample group. But I, it's clear that when we elicit oxytocin, which really requires for us to get it in return to give, it's not something like dopamine where you can elicit it from yourself. This work mm -hmm. comes from uh, Dr. Paul Zak, who's done some amazing work in, in this space it does require us to have more of a we paradigm than an I paradigm, which is really hard here in the West where, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of dog eat dog. Right. And so uh, there is some inherent truth. And I think, you know, the study did uncover the fact that when we are able to give out to the world, it generally does tend to reciprocate in some way. And that can either be again, through this sense of feeling like you're connected all the way to if you do believe there's some, you know, latency of logic to everything, you know, some sort of karmic force, as you know, but from it a pre does make, It's common sense, too, because, I mean, when I have a meal and I have a great meal and I enjoy it, but if I'm sharing it with another person and we're doing it together, it's so much more pleasurable. And same like going on vacation or doing activities together because there's somebody you can talk to and you can share, you share those experiences, right? So for me, when, when they did the study, I'm like, finally, science is kind of showing the right direction there because I could have my meal, but if I have it with another person, it's so much fun. I could have my own podcast, but if I'm talking to another person, it's more fun. It's more interactive. And to me, that seems common sense, but we often don't follow common sense. Well, and from a more behavioral economic standpoint, mm -hmm. every material, not every, most material goods have diminishing utility. We just understand mm -hmm. that as a fundamental quantitative principle, right? But when we give to others, we sort of circumvent that because we don't necessarily need to think about the monetary value we got from that, right? We essentially had, you know, a disposable resource and we shared that in a very kind way. And so once you get to actualize, you know, this act of kindness, you don't necessarily need to unpack like, oh, well, that wasn't worth 20 bucks because you're not thinking in that way, right? You know, like, you know, whether you gave 20 or 40, you're not disseminating you know, some monetary worth from that kind yeah, act, exactly. right? You just, yeah. and so, yeah, it definitely has, you know, more staying power. And then again, you know, I don't quite understand it and, and, and we share that I'm agnostic, but there just does seem to be some sort of cosmic force that if you wait around, you know, for the return, then it mm -hmm. won't happen. But that if in mass you do this kind of stuff, somehow, you know, through some form of magic, the universe does Karma. you know Karma. yeah, yeah. yeah. i've it seen does it time and time again and folks that you know have the sam harris slant like i do they'll mm -hmm. still admit it you know they're just things that we don't quite understand yet and so i don't believe in kind of the dog dogmatic you know mm -hmm. concept of, of karma but it's clear that if you're a good person for the most part that you'll be supported. Now, bad things might science. still happen to you. But. but it's based on science, action and reaction. I mean, it, it takes time. Of course, it takes time. And so when people who do evil in the world, and we do see a lot of them, they do get their uh, their punishment 
sooner or later. And sometimes we do really have to be patient. I've seen it with uh, in, in small situations in my private life too, where, where things don't turn out well for, for the people who do badly and they, who, who chose the wrong path. And I do strongly believe in that, just as a as a, as a as a principle of the of the universe. Now, without looking at any dogmas or or, or beliefs. Yeah, I agree. It just and to me, that's also common sense. If I am happy, this happiness will and uh, will also emanate to others, and they'll be happy too. So everyone wins. It's a win win well, situation. To your point, that that is one where we can circle back to empirical evidence. It's clear that whether causal or casual that social contagion is a real phenomena, mm -hmm. right? And so unfortunately we have a predisposition to always sort of be on edge, which makes sense, yeah. you know, if you're an evolutionary scientist, but yeah. Yeah. if we use the agency and autonomy that life has gifted us to be happy, we can really have ripple effects mm -hmm. around, you know, the folks that we are. And so that's another uh, facet that I use in our argument in the book is that, if we can kind of rise above and realize that we can use our autonomy to sort of have a growth mindset about the abundance of good in the world, because there's an abundance of bad and good, and you'll <laughs> find either if you go looking for it. So <laughs> I posit to the listeners, why not bias yourself towards the good, knowing the bad is going to come, right? Because- Oh, again, you shouldn't ignore it. In no way you should ignore it. But just, just again, the focus. I mean, that's, again, the glass uh, half full, half empty. I just think I have a half glass of water. I can drink it. It's there, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I think just kind of changing that perspective. Yes, it is half empty, but who cares? No, that's not necessarily what I'm going to focus on, but it does exist. And I think that's, again, we don't want to delude ourselves. And that's sometimes I have issues with positive uh, psychology, where they just say, yeah, just change your mind about things. No, it doesn't go away. It's not that simple. And I think one of the issues is why people choose recreational drugs is exactly that, the lack of meaning or happiness in their lives. And they see it as an escape. And you can use anything as an escape, but that's, that's an example that comes to mind. Because they're not having enough fun in their lives. Yeah, it certainly gets you out of the malaise, right? I talk in the book that I only use a couple of kind of scientific terms, but one is valence. And whenever we're in negative valence, which is essentially a fancy way of saying discomfort, right? I mean, it could be extreme discomfort like pain. It could be mild discomfort like boredom. But when we're in a negative valence state, our natural reaction is to try and get out of it. And drugs are an extremely effective way to do that. Unfortunately, they're also extremely addictive and bad for you, both, you know, physiologically, most of them and psychologically, some of them. So, um, you know, they're also really interesting, you know, in, in some regard, especially if you're using them in, in a spiritual context, it's clear, uh, you know, I've been fascinated with the science around ketamine, right? That it, it's clear mm -hmm. that it kind of can really help some folks because there is some uh, neural uh, genesis that comes, you know, from partaking in that under guidance, right? Not mm -hmm. recreationally. Right. So uh, we got off the script a little bit, but the, yeah, it's certainly uh, drug use is, is terrible. Um, but what's as insidious is again, you know, kind of going to these really low forms of leisure in the literature, we call this passive leisure, you know, and allowing them to circumvent our attention, you know, mm -hmm. when we kind of, you know, are in that mode of discomfort, unfortunately, like if we're on something like Instagram, instead of celebrating, you know, our kids, you know, our friends, kids having fun or, oh, I'm so stoked. My friend went on vacation. That reminds me I need to go on vacation. Mm -hmm. Instead, you get in a state of rumination of comparison, right? Like why, mm -hmm. you know, and we forget that these are the curated lives of, you know, oftentimes not even the people that we know, and that can really be, you know, problematic. And so we, um, you know, in this modern world, we have, you know, from all, all the way from drugs to things like social media, to even, you know, uh, things that potentially at, at the onset are healthy, like exercise that turn into a way to escape the real world. Yes, exactly. There are all exactly. Ways, there are tons of ways to. Uh, and, and people don't see it though. That's exactly what I want to get to. A workaholic is seen as that badge of honor. It's like, I'm a workaholic. And it's like, no, it's the same as the drugs. It's just like different things, different situation. But in the end, it leads to the same kind of lack of fun and lack of meaning, lack of leisure. And that is harmful for the psyche. And I think we should really be open to that, that uh, like anything could serve uh, as, as, a, as an addiction, as, a, as an outlet for, as an escape 
basically, including exercise or even meditation. Because I know people who use that as a refuge, like I'm escaping. And that's not it. I think we really have to be in life, be fully alive, confront the issues and feel like grounded here. At the same time, dream and give ourselves time to 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 dream and to imagine things differently and to just enjoy these moments that come to us. I, I, I talked to a, a, a myst, who, somebody who's very interested in mysticism, uh, Jewish mysticism, and talked about the Shabbat and the idea of like, these moments are perfect in themselves. These few moments that we have, these glimpses that we have, kind of a spiritual outlook. But then that is really beneficial for you ben, because you can relax for a few moments. Everything is fine now. I don't have to worry about this, my chores, my job, my life, what's happening in the world. And just take time to to relax. And I think we need more of that. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny, you, you brought it up a couple of times. So I, in the book, I talk about um, that very thing about meditation. And mm-hmm. um, I like Sam Harris's Waking Up app. And uh, and I was using it in conjunction with the Muse uh, headband. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but uh, it's essentially a wearable that helps you track you know the success of your meditation. Okay. Cool, yeah. But it was nudging me towards more. And I like you know, uh, this whole idea of minimal effective dose, right? Like uh, it was brought forth to me through Tim Ferriss, but like, you know, we really should only do as much of something as it's good for us, right? And think of a meal, think of a meal. I mean, you eat it, you're fine and don't eat more because then it's not going to be enjoyable if you have more than you can handle, right? That's exactly right. And uh, so Sam Harris, you know, to his credit, walked it back. He called it uh, spiritual materialism. You know, this whole idea that instead of enjoying the benefits and really it being this act of self-care, um, because, you know, all these apps and things create badges and say, hey, you know, this person meditated for 30 days straight. Like it had turned into this sort of external form of validation that like totally runs contra to, you know, w- what everyone was trying to start in the first place. And so it's a great metaphor for, you know, the broader issue of, you know, sometimes we get caught in these loops, like, you know, we don't understand how this has happened. Yes, exactly. Just that I I have a Vivino app where it kind of tracks my wine drinking and my rating. And then there are others who are ahead of me. I was like, maybe I should drink more wine. But I was like, no, I'm I'm keeping my limit once a week. I'm not going to fall for that. But being aware of that, I think that's really important. Those loops that are happening and just kind of putting it, uh, bring it from the unconscious here to the conscious and just thinking about, do I really need that, that badge on my app? Or am I happier not following that? You know, that we have a choice in here. I never thought about that in regards <laughs> to alcoholic consumption, because I have some friends that are on a, a craft beer app as well. And like, what? But you get ratings, more. right? And that's that dopamine where it's like, I want to get higher ratings. I have to drink more, evaluate, rate, like rate more, and then I'll be higher up in in the country it gives you like what position you have that would be an interesting study to see you know (laughs) if um unbeknownst to them they had actually you know created alcoholics through something that was probably you know set up just to create an interesting you know uh addictive product and Mm -hmm. instead you know Mm -hmm. drove people to their threshold of uh you know it being harmful yeah yeah, that can happen. And thank you so much, Dr. Mike Rucker. I just want to remind everyone, uh, I, um, your book is The Fun Habit, uh, How the Pursuit of Joy and Wonder Can Change Your Life. It definitely can. And uh, I hope more people will take advantage of this, of reading your book and following the advice to make sure that they have a more fun-filled and more wonderful life and to notice that a bit more as well. As because, so it becomes a habit. It's something that we, we continue on a, on a daily basis as well. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for being here.